Hi, I'm Sean from DishonorableSpeechAndPolitics.com, and in this third of three videos on which children's stories may be good for your child's developing psychology and which ones may not, I'll provide my list of 11 books I identified some dishonorable themes in. They're in alphabetical order by title. With each one, I've included what I believe are the dishonorable speech categories out of the 37 categories I use to identify dishonorable speech by politicians on my website, and any other potential issues I see, along with some suggested more honorable versions. Number one, Amazing Grace. When Grace got home, she seemed sad. What's the matter, asked Ma. Raj said I can't be Peter Pan because I'm a girl. That just shows what Raj knows, said Ma. I identified this as dishonorable speech category number one, an insult. That just shows how much Raj knows is insulting, I believe. A girl can be Peter Pan if she wants to. Grace cheered up. Then later she remembered something else. I identified this as category number 14, blame that things or situations are responsible for happiness. Natalie says I can't be Peter Pan because I'm black, she said. Ma looked angry. Category number six, anger implies someone's bad. But before she could speak, Nana said, It seems that Natalie is another one who don't know nothing. You can be anything you want, Grace, if you put your mind to it. Again, I identified this as category number one, an insult. Now, my suggested more honorable version is, When Grace got home, she seemed to have something on her mind. What's the matter, asked Ma. Raj said I can't be Peter Pan because I'm a girl. Oh, honey, he's mistaken, said Ma. A girl can be Peter Pan if she wants to. Grace seemed to like this answer, then later she remembered something else. Natalie says, I can't be Peter Pan because I'm black, she said. At which point Nana spoke. How sad for Natalie and Raj that they don't know that you can be anything you want, Grace, if you put your mind to it. I think this suggested more honorable version promotes more compassion for Natalie and Raj, while also conveying less of a suggestion that others' views on things can cause you to be upset. Number two, Elmer. It was Elmer who kept the other elephants happy. Their games and jokes were always his idea. If an elephant was laughing, the cause was usually Elmer. I identified this as dishonorable speech category number 14, blaming, for positive emotions. This can help instill that you have value and are worthy of being loved if you make others happy by being a clown. I don't have a suggested more honorable version for this story to help convey that elephants and people have value whether they help make others laugh or not. Number three, giraffes can't dance. Gerald swallowed bravely as he walked toward the floor, but the lions saw him coming and they soon began to roar. Hey, look at clumsy Gerald, the animals all sneered. Giraffes can't dance, you silly fool. Oh, Gerald, you're so weird. Gerald simply froze up. He was rooted to the spot. They're right, he thought. I'm useless. Oh, I feel like such a clot. So he crept off the dance floor, and he started walking home. He'd never felt so sad before, so sad, and so alone. Identified this as category number one, insult for silly fool, weird, and to himself as useless. And also category number 14, blame that his situation made him feel sad and alone. In this story, I'd like to see self-acceptance even if you can't dance and others laugh at you. My suggested more honorable version is, Gerald swallowed bravely as he walked toward the floor, but the lions saw him coming and they soon began to roar. Hey, look at clumsy Gerald, the animals all sneered. Giraffes can't dance, Gerald. If they could, it might be weird. Gerald simply froze up. He was rooted to the spot. Is that right, he thought? I guess I don't know because I haven't danced a lot. So he crept off the dance floor and he started walking home. Some other day, he might practice more dancing on his own. Number four, Grumpy Monkey. Why are you grumpy, Jim? asked the others. It's such a wonderful day. I'm not grumpy, and he stormed off. Jim felt sorry, a little sorry for shouting at everyone, but mostly sorry for himself. I guess I am grumpy, Jim sighed. And just as he was starting to feel really sad, I'll probably feel better soon enough, too. For now, I need to be grumpy. It's a wonderful day to be grumpy, said Norman. Jim agreed and he already felt a little bit better. I identified this as dishonorable speech category number 14, blame of others for being angry, and number 21, being disrespectful by shouting. While I do believe it's okay to be grumpy sometimes, I also believe you can learn to change your emotional state rather than just wait it out. Some Amazon reviewers noted that Jim didn't apologize to his friends for shouting at them. One Amazon reviewer said the illustrations were scary. My suggested more honorable version is, I'm not grumpy, and he stormed off. Jim felt sorry, sorry for shouting at everyone, so he went back to apologize. I'm sorry for yelling. I know you're only trying to help. I guess I am grumpy. I'll probably feel better soon enough, too. Thank you for trying to help me see that I could stop being so grumpy if I wanted to. And in appreciating his friends, he already felt a little bit better. Number five, oh, the places you'll go. You can get so confused that you'll start in to race down long, wiggled roads at a brick-necking pace and grind on for miles across weirdish wild space, headed, I fear, toward a most useless place, the waiting place, for people just waiting, waiting for a train to go or a bus to come. Everyone is just waiting. No, that's not for you. Somehow you'll escape all that waiting and staying. 
I identified this as category number 10, saying something, waiting, is bad without acknowledging the good, such as it promoting patience. Oh, the places you'll go. There is fun to be done. There are points to be scored. There are games to be won. And the magical things you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame. You'll be famous as famous can be, with the whole wide world watching you win on TV, except when they don't, because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too. Games you can't win because you'll play against you. To me, this promotes impatience, fear of missing out, and I'd also say it falls under dishonorable speech category number 31, misleading, in that it, in my opinion, promotes winning and fame as things to strive for that will somehow make you feel good, with no talk of putting integrity and effort first. I don't have a suggested more honorable version for this one. Personally, I think this is a good book to give a high school graduate to perhaps remind them of other Dr. Seuss books you used to read to them as a child, but I wouldn't read it to someone five years old or less. I actually got this book as a graduate, and it was touching. I might update part of the text for these days, though, to read. You'll be as famous as a giant melting ice cube with the whole wide world watching you on YouTube. Except when they don't, because so far, they haven't. That's my story. That's going to change, though. I can feel it. Number six, the bad seed. Category number one, name calling in a bad seed in the title. I believe this promotes the good bad model of people being bad because they do bad actions, not just being people who do bad actions. I don't have a suggested more honorable version for this one. The good bad model of people, rather than just people's actions being bad, is implicit in the title and throughout the book, in my opinion. Number seven, the book with no pictures. The kid I'm reading this book to is the best kid ever in the history of the entire world. Oh, really? And this kid is the smartest kid, too, because this kid chose this book even though it had no pictures because kids know this is the book that makes grown-ups have to say silly things. I identified this as category number 23, leveling, that all kids are the best and smartest. I also believe this supports kids thinking they somehow have more intrinsic value as people if they're the best or smartest, although this is more subtle. My suggested more honorable version is, the kid I'm reading this book to is a great kid who I care about very much, even if this kid chose this book with no pictures because kids know this is the book that makes grown-ups have to say silly things. Number eight, the cat in the hat comes back. This was no time for play. This was no time for fun. This was no time for games. There was work to be done. This sends the message that you can't have fun while you're working, which I believe misrepresents or misleads about reality. And then I got mad. This was no time for fun. Identified this as category number 14, blaming for getting mad. All this does is make more spots, we yelled at the cat. Your cats are no good. Put them back in your hat. Identified this as category number 11, misrepresenting reality. You're good if you do good and not if you don't. Also, the cats use pop guns to kill spots, which could be considered as promoting violence. I don't have a simple, suggested, more honorable version of these parts of the story. Number nine, the giving tree. In this story, the tree gives everything it has to the boy and is happy, while the boy never seems happy and is materialistic. And when he came back, the tree was so happy she could hardly speak. Come, boy, she whispered. Come and play. I am too old and sad to play, said the boy. I want a boat that will take me far away from here. Can you give me a boat? Identify this as category number 15, promoting victim mentality and also category number 14, blame, that things or situations are responsible for happiness. Some may say the moral of the story is when you love someone, you give fully of yourself to them without concern of them giving back, or something about the joy of giving, it's better to give than receive. But to me, though, this isn't healthy giving. In my opinion, it supports your life being somehow worth less and you being a tool for others to use, and it's okay for them to use you like that. I think it's actually not okay for them and their development as a person to use you like that. I'm not sure that this story has a simple, more honorable version I could suggest. Maybe the guy getting gradually wiser with time and really coming to appreciate the tree in the end, both for just being a tree and for always being there for him. And the tree also not being as worried about the boy being happy at the moment as about doing what's good for the boy and his healthy development as a person. Number 10, the little house. Now the little house only saw the sun at noon and didn't see the moon or stars at night at all because the lights of the city were too bright. She didn't like living in the city. The little house was very sad and lonely. Her paint was cracked and dirty. Her windows were broken and her shutters hung crookedly. She looked shabby, though she was just as good a house as ever underneath. When the little house saw the green grass and heard the birds singing, she didn't feel sad anymore. As the little house settled down on her new foundation, she smiled happily. Never again would she be curious about the city. Identified these as dishonorable speech category number 10, implying something, the city, is bad without acknowledging the good parts of it. And number 14, blame that things or situations are responsible for happiness. I don't have a simple, more honorable version to suggest. In a new version of the story, I'd want to see the house realizing it could be happy anywhere, even if it preferred the country, have it recognize that there was some good in the city, 
and maintain its curiosity about the city, such as wondering how it may evolve with time. Number 11, the story of Babar. Babar is riding happily on his mother's back when a wicked hunter, hidden behind some bushes, shoots at them. Category number one, name-calling and insults with wicked. That's what I identified for that. Luckily, a very rich old lady, who has always been fond of little elephants, understands right away that he is longing for a fine suit. As she likes to make people happy, she gives him her purse. I identified this as category number 11, misrepresenting reality through the mind reader fallacy that she knows what he's thinking. And number 14, blaming, as in make people happy. He goes out for an automobile ride every day. The old lady has given him the car. She gives him whatever he wants. I identified this as category number 15, promoting entitlement. My suggested more honorable versions are, Babar is riding happily on his mother's back when a hunter hidden behind some bushes shoots at them. Luckily, a very rich old lady who has always been fond of little elephants understands right away that he may like a fine suit. As she enjoys doing things for others, she gives him her purse. He goes out for an automobile ride every day. The old lady has given him the car. She's very generous with him. While I believe my suggested more honorable versions improve the story, it wouldn't be enough for me personally to want to read this modified story to a child. It still implies too much for me that things can make a person happy, and it's a good thing to give someone lots of things they haven't earned, or perhaps in more plain terms, it promotes materialism and spoiling of kids, or teaching entitlement rather than gratitude, in my opinion. Now, if you have any books on this list, should you throw them away? Not necessarily, in my opinion. You may want to save them for when your child is old enough to understand so you can explain to them what the dishonor is in that story and how it may have affected other children who heard the story when they were young. And most of the stories that I've read through have some good stuff in them, even if they may contain some dishonorable themes, so I'm not proposing to treat them as if they were all bad. Books can also be rewritten. Authors who are still alive could release a new edition, especially if you bring the issue to their attention in a kind manner. You could also try to edit the books yourself, such as with a marker, although you may want to be ready for questions if your child notices that. And even if they don't learn it in children's stories, your kids can still learn to love and respect everyone and have other qualities I believe to be positive for their development, especially if you set a good example, such as by liking this video and following my channel. That last part was a joke. If, uh, if you watch the first video, it's okay to be silly, remember? If you have suggestions of stories you want me to look at for Dishonor to possibly include in a future video, please list them in the comments for this video. I hope this video series was helpful and somewhat entertaining, and thank you for watching.